so sorry I was such a pain in the ass to track down. No, no. Uh, thank you very much for, for, for having this conversation with me. I'm, I'm very happy to do it. Uh, I'd like to start explaining why I'm so interesting, interested in this kind of research. And I am a, um, a reader of science uh, for quite some time now. And uh, for quite some time, I'm aware of this kind of research development psychologists have done, the work of Paul Bloom have done, uh, the work of uh, Tomazello and, and sure. Morgan and uh, Altruism and Kids and Chimps. And I knew all along. And one day I got, I got, uh, I was checking book on Amazon and I see the genius of dogs. And I let out there. I, I forgot about it. And all the yeah. day I watching television and I see a documentary about dogs. And I, it got me my interest. And I watch it. And it was you. And I want to check the book and, and, and you ah. that I see as the same person. And one week after that, you, I, I was recommended a course on Coursera. Is your course again, and I got everything on, and the course I, I everything makes sense because you are being uh, advised by Tomazello, so everything makes there sense. There you go. Yeah, it's, it's very interesting. In some sense, I think that the the research follow the same way my interest progressed in some sense. Well, yeah. So I was totally a student of Mike's, and uh, I don't know if you know, but he's coming to Duke in uh, July. So yeah. So he's his um. His department in uh, in Germany, uh, they they have forced retirement, and he's 68, and so he's gonna um, move to Duke and be a professor here. So it's gonna be really fun, and so uh, but yeah, I was his student, and I learned you know he and Richard Wrangham and Joseph Call were really my big um, you know intellectual uh, mentors. Ah, I don't know. I hope he studies dogs. I hope so. Uh, the, uh, the, yeah, but definitely infants, and I'm sure he will study chimpanzees. I don't know. He, he's never been so interested in bonobos. Uh, and then uh, dogs, hopefully, hopefully. But uh, the whole story of how it got started is hilarious. I mean, it really is what 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 I said in the in the book and in the course. It's really true. I was. I was just a little kid. I was 19, and he was telling the, you know, this whole idea about how humans happen. And I was like, I think my dog does that. <laughs> this is one of my questions, so you can progress. Uh, All right, cool. So yeah, no, it really is a true story. And um, you know, he he, uh, I guess he didn't have a dog growing up, but um, I can't remember. But but uh, he was great. I mean, it, it's exactly what I, I I said in different places. Is you know, that's when I learned what science was. Because even though there was this big idea and it was super important for how humans happen, you know, at first he kind of laughed when I said that dogs could do that. And then he became really curious. And, and then, you know, he basically said to me, okay, I will help you come up with a way to prove me wrong. And that's incredible. And then when it ended up that he was wrong you know, about dogs, he was so excited. <laughs> he thought it was the coolest thing. And he, he said, let's do more, let's do more. And so it was amazing to me that, you know, it was, you know, that's what science is. It, I think people think science is all about, oh, being in a lab coat and smart and Einstein and whatever and, and uh, coming up with genius ideas. What it really is, is it's a, it's a way to falsify ideas. And, 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 I, I wanted to keep track about two things. One is the fact that you're going to uncover with the dog's research, and the other is the process of science. I love to uh, learn how scientists think about science. I think it's fascinating uh, right. to discuss about what we really think about science. And, uh, and that quote that you make and you make on your course, and, and the course is that uh, science is, is all about be willing to test that you might be wrong. I think it's, it's fantastic. Yeah, I mean, I mean, the more you do it, the more you realize it's like, oh shit, this is all about, am I wrong? <laughs> so you have to be pretty brave, and that's why, you know, and, and it also it has huge implications for for you know all levels of society. And that anytime I ever see any kind of heat and any kind of debate, even ones I'm in, you know, the why is there heat? The reason that there's heat and people are getting emotional is because it's not clear how to falsify the 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 ideas that are making people disagree. There, it, 
And so, sometimes you know, that's there, why... Sometimes there are several news uh, uh, about myths, and, and this is something that I've, that, that I've done. I uh, write for magazines and, and, and try to debunk some myths. And oh, cool. People don't realize how sometimes tricky it would be to come up with a test uh, to yeah. really prove that idea. Yeah. They, 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 they spread the idea without knowing that. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Oh, yeah, myth busting. That's another situation. I mean, that's a whole other thing about, like, why, uh, you know, why are people averse to facts? That's a whole other topic. But, but um, you know, in terms of knowledge production or, or, you know, a system that produces beliefs, I mean, I think that's where science is completely unique is that, you know, the, the knowledge is produced by, you know, constantly trying to prove that you're wrong. And then when you end up like five times, I've tried to say that this hypothesis is wrong. Well, then you say, well, gosh, it must be right. I mean, that's how it works. It's hilarious. I mean, nobody does that normally in their life, yeah. you know. You have confirmation bias, right? I think this is how it works. And look, I'll give you five reasons. That, 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 that. You know? So, uh, so I think that's what makes science so special. Yeah. So, uh, I'd like to start with asking you, um, um, what, what do you mean by genius? Because we're going to talk about the genius of dogs in the whole interview. So, I think it's time to lay it out for cognitive scientists what, really, what you really mean by being a genius. Yeah, so if, if, you know, we say in the beginning of the book, if, if you're talking about, you know, high IQ and, you know, uh, who's going to get recruited to work for NASA uh, or be the astronaut going to Mars, you know, uh, this is a very short book. We're not talking about that. Um, you know, I think the big um, discovery in the cognitive revolution or the big change in the school of thought about cognition is that, you know, cognition isn't something you have more or less of. Uh, and it's some unidimensional trait. It's not one thing. Um, it's actually a, a whole set of skills. Uh, we don't even really know how many there are. And the key thing is that they can vary independently. So you can be really a genius in one area, and you can be completely uh, idiotic in another. Um, you know, uh, you can have somebody who is great at math, they're a terrible communicator. You can have somebody who's a great communicator and they're not very good at math, you know, on and on and on. And so when, when you're talking about, um, you know, non-human primates or you're talking about non-humans, well, and then you take an evolutionary perspective, it makes it even more clear how silly the idea of having uh, this continuum of who's smarter or not as the dominant, um, you know, idea. Uh, because, you know, I get asked all the time, what's smarter? You know, who's smarter, a dog or a cat or, you know, a chimpanzee or a dolphin or whatever? And, you know, I always say, well, look, if a dolphin's in a tree or a chimp's underwater, uh, you know, neither of them seem particularly smart. Uh, and so each species has evolved to solve a set of problems that help them survive and reproduce. And, you know, dogs aren't any different. And so the genius of dogs is all about trying to understand how could a species that seems utterly unremarkable, uh, how could it be so successful? And success being defined from an evolutionary perspective, it's everywhere. It is everywhere there are people, there are dogs. It is the most successful mammal, uh, aside from people. Uh, maybe the next competitor would be cows. Um, but, you know, I think dogs are even more successful because there are many places where there are no cows. Yeah. So... So, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, right, exactly. It's a little hard to have a cow in your ho house, uh, unless we unless we do some serious selection on size. Yeah. But um, of your house or the cow, I don't know. But uh, <laughs> yeah. So 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 anyway, you have this hugely successful spe species that seems utterly unremarkable. Um, how did it happen? And and so that's what the book explores is. Uh, do dogs have some type of genius, psychologically or cognitively? Well, yes, maybe they are very similar to other, every other mammal uh, in many ways psychologically. Maybe they're unremarkable, like truly, um, you know, cognitively somehow um, not as sophisticated as most mammals. But is there something that's special about them? Is there something where they show a, an unusual degree of sophistication, flexibility in solving problems? 
this experiment that you start with, Michael, let, let's talk about a bit. Uh, how were the first experiments that you that have done? Yeah, well, the basically, he was explaining to me how important gestural communication is in human development and how he thought that that was crucial to human evolution, too. And the key moment was he said, I think it's unique to humans that kids develop the ability to use human gestures and understand communicative intent. And I said, well, I think my dog could do that uh, because I had a dog that played fetch and he liked to have multiple tennis balls in his mouth all the time. And uh, so I would throw the ball and he'd run off and I would get it. And th then I'd throw his other ball. And then when he was on his way back, I'd point to the one that he hadn't seen me throw. So he would kind of orbit in that direction and he could find it. Um, so Mike said, well, listen, you know, you seem pretty serious that you think your dog can do this. You know, Every textbook I ever read gives dogs the example that if you point, they look at your finger. But, okay, you, you seem really convinced. So why don't we do an experiment? And it was really, really simple. And this is one of the great lessons of science is not only is it all about being wrong, but also what unifies science isn't that it's complicated uh, or it's all rocket science. It's that it's powerful. So we used a really powerful but very, very simple technique, which is we just hid food in one of two places, and then we pointed to where we hit it. Now, with kids, you hide a toy, but with an animal, you hide, you know, food, uh, and then you just try to help them search for it. Uh, and it ends up that great apes are terrible at this. They, they really don't show much flexibility. They, they have to really learn, and every time you use kind of a slightly different gesture, they have to relearn it. Uh, kids, on the other hand, you know, when they get to be about 12 months, you know, you can do things they've never seen before. You can gesture in all sorts of different ways, and they, they show a degree of flexibility that you don't see in great apes. So the question is, what do dogs do? And we ran the same series of experiments that had been done with um, apes and, and human children. Well, they looked more like kids. And so that was a big surprise. And when we ran a bunch of controls, uh, it wasn't just they were using their nose to find the food. You know, it wasn't just that they were reacting to the motions you make. It really did... Yeah, it, 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 and, and, you know, we thought it would be something simple because in science there's two steps, and this is often overlooked, is you first have to demonstrate a phenomenon. So, you know, if it's gravitational waves or dogs following gestures, you've got to demonstrate there's a phenomenon. So that's the first step. Then, once you have a phenomenon, you try to explain it. And often people are so busy trying to explain something before they even demonstrate that it exists. So, you know... Once we had dogs following pointing gestures, we want to know, oh, is it that they just smell it, and it ends up it's not. Now, people resist this idea uh, very, uh, you know, yeah, yeah, and it's healthy, and I think it's a great... I think it's healthy, because if something, I was discussing yesterday with a friend of mine, and if someone is very skeptical about an idea, and he turned out to be convinced, I mean, chances are, I mean, the evidence is like to be very high for... Yeah, there you go. Well, I, and I always say, you're welcome to be skeptical, just don't be cynical. And so, so you know, the skepticism is welcome. And, and again, it, it just goes to following Mike's example is, look, if you don't believe me, I'll give you a Dognition game. You know, in Dognition, we have a game where it's you, you uh, hide food, the dog looks where you hide it, but then you close its eyes and move it. And if it's smelling the food, it'll go to where you moved it. And it won't go to where it saw it. So go try it. See what your dog does. And of course, you know, when we've done this with millions of dogs, dogs go where they saw it, not where the food is. And so you can try it yourself. Um, and, and so, uh, you know, that's the fun thing is then you find out if you have the mind of scientists. Because, you know, if you try it and then you maybe you're not completely convinced with our method and you try a couple other things, you know, I'm almost certain you're going to find the dog isn't going to be using their nose. Um, and, uh, you know, that's the, that's the point at which you get to see are people struggling with the fact that they might not be right. <laughs> but people believe that dogs are using a nose. I mean, uh, the, the citizens uh, that participate in dog mission, they believe that dogs are using nose. Yeah, I think lots of people, I think most people, even us, when we started, I mean, it wasn't any different where we were. We were like, you know, when we came up with the idea, we knew we had to look at um, whether they were using their nose. Yeah, and so, um, you know, it was surprising to us, too. So I think it's natural to think that, because we emphasize so much how, um, 
how good dogs' noses are. But here's the catch is, you know, if you're a wolf and you're hunting a deer and you enter a field, do you use your eyes and scan and see if there's any deer in the field? Or do you start sniffing around and see if you can smell the deer? Of course you look. You would instantly see their deer there. And then if they run away, okay, well now you don't see them anymore, so now use your nose. But the first thing you're gonna do, and the fastest thing you can do to solve a problem is use your eyes. And so what we found again and again and again is wolves, foxes, dogs, they prefer to use their eyes, but when they can't get the information they need, then they start using their nose. So um, in these experiments, uh, again and again, we've seen dogs prioritize information from their, from their eyes and what they remember um, over their nose. I think one of the most, uh, for me, uh, I think one of the most fascinating uh, experiments uh, with dogs is the one that was two barriers. One is opaque and the other isn't. Uh, oh, yeah. I think that's fascinating to, to, to be able to show that dog can actually uh, know what I can see. I think that's yeah. Yeah. So, so, so that's the work of Julian Kaminsky and Mike Tomasello too, and Joseph Call. And uh, yeah, so they have an opaque and a transparent barrier, and they put a ball between each, or sorry, a ball behind each barrier, and so the dog can see both balls. Uh, and then in the uh, in the experimental condition. The dog is on the, a human is on the opposite side of the barriers and says fetch, and the amazing thing is the dogs don't take the ball um, from the barrier that the human can't see through, the opaque barrier. They actually tend to take the ball from the transparent barrier, uh, which is the ball the human could see. Now in the control condition, the human actually comes on the other side and is in the same place with the dog and is seeing the same thing the dog is seeing and thus can see both. And in that condition, they just choose a chance. They choose randomly uh, between the two barriers. So that suggests maybe dogs know what we can or can't see. It's fascinating. And what about, you, you, you know, some point about seeing this phenomenon of this remarkable dog's ability to communication with humans, to reading humans and communicative intentions, you, you have to come up with explanations uh, for this phenomenon. So what, what were the explanations that uh, you might Yeah, so, well, there's different levels to explain it. So we can explain it on uh, from a developmental perspective. We can explain it from an evolutionary perspective, meaning, like, why would selection uh, favor that or did it? Um, and I think what you mean is mechanistically, cognitively, what's going on in the minds of the dog uh, when they're doing this. And, you know, because of the way science works, really all we can do is, I know people talk about proving things all the time, but truthfully, that's not how science works. You can't really ever prove anything. Yeah. All you can do is falsify. So, so all you can do is say, okay, so we have a phenomenon. I point, and the dog goes to where I point. And if you look at a group of dogs, they tend to do that. And statistically, they're above chance. So they must be using my gesture, because if you do the control where you don't use a gesture, well, they chant, they're a chance. So it must be they use the visual information. Okay, well, what are they doing? Are they doing what kids do? And the thought about kids is that kids really, when you're doing that, they're saying, what does he want? I'm trying to think about, um, you know, what's going on in the mind of the other being and guess what they want. And therefore, I can interpret the gesture as, oh, he's trying to help me. He's trying to tell me there's something there. Well, the alternative is that, you know, we talked about they might just smell it. Okay, we've ruled that out. Another alternative is, well, dogs aren't thinking about what's going on in your mind. They're saying, I want to know where the food is. Notice I, I want to know where the food is. Oh, I just saw that he moved. He wiggled this way. Um, so when I see wiggling this way, it catches my attention, and I'm going to go there. So it really is just, you know, you wiggled your arm, and so the dog goes that way. So we've done controls where we ruled that out, where we actually move away from where the food is, and you know, we we have the we rule out the idea that it's motion. Um, well, what about if it's you know, another, another, another level of explanation would be, well, okay, you know, dogs have seen you gesture hundreds of times. So, you know, you point, 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 point. Everybody points their dog. It's just what humans do. So they slowly have learned this. They don't really do it in any kind of flexible way. Um, and 
it ends up that you can test that idea by giving them things they've never seen before. So you can, for instance, point with your foot. Most people don't point to things with their foot uh, and see if the dog can use that gesture. Or you can use a crazy gesture where, you know, you take an object, um, let's say like this crazy thing I got here, and you put that on top of where the food is. And you don't even show them placing it there. They just see that you're holding it and then it, you know, appears on the, on the cup. Can they understand that that means that you're trying to help them? Kids do it. Uh, chimpanzees don't, but it ends up dogs do. So, you know, that rules out the idea that this is something inflexible, that it takes a, lot, a long time to learn, etc. Now, the hard part comes to how do you then distinguish between, you know, they have a, a sophisticated, flexible behavioral strategy, and they actually really are thinking about what you are thinking about. Ooh. And that's where it gets really hard. And I would say that we don't really have the smoking gun experiment to rule out, um, you know, alternative explanations. Uh, I think we have the, I think the best data we have is from great apes um, when it comes to thinking about the thoughts of others. Um, but, sorry? Yeah, they're in mind, exactly. And so, um, so I think we have the best evidence from probably great apes and maybe birds, actually, the corvids. Um, I don't know that the absolute, you know, do we have evidence that dogs are going in this direction? Absolutely. Do we have overwhelming evidence where I can say, here are the three experiments that prove, you know, sort of really, um, you know, falsify the alternatives and, you know, suggest or prove that it's like what chimps are doing? Uh, not quite. Even the experiment on the barriers that you mentioned, um, where the dog can see what the other dog can't, that experiment hasn't been replicated. Um, and so and when you have something that is so sensational like that, you want to see another group find the same thing. And so, you know, we don't know if it's going to replicate yet. We should do it here, actually. And, uh, and, 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 and you, anytime you, when you're doing something like that, you want to see multiple experiments where an animal is doing, showing that sort of same kind of skill. So we have that with great apes. We don't have that with dogs yet. But uh, what about the evolutionary perspective? How does dog uh, come up with this kind of amazing skills? I mean, what the, uh, you said that the, the evidence is not so unremarkable, but we have a, a kind of evidence. I think we have an interesting body of evidence. So far. So, yeah. Yeah. So like how, so, well, first of all, I mean, I think the big thing is that, I mean, dogs do have a genius and it is using human gestures, using human communication and using us like social tools to solve a whole bunch of problems that they couldn't solve without us. So then the question becomes, well, where did it come from? How did it evolve? And we tested a whole bunch of hypotheses. One is, well, they're just related to wolves and wolves are really clever and can do this kind of thing. And then um, the other is that, um, well, it's experience. They interact with us, and they just kind of slowly learn to do these things. And then the last one is, well, what if it was something that happened during the investigation? And from, from the most part of my career, uh, the evidence has looked mostly like it's in favor of the idea that it's domestication, that, that, that um, essentially selection for friendliness uh, is what allowed dogs to become more skilled at reading um, and using humans to solve problems. And that was a surprise, actually, because um, why being selected to be friendly would make you smarter, uh, you know, that certainly wasn't when I set out uh, to, do, to ask that question where I thought we were headed. And how, how the balaya of foxes uh, come into play to answer uh, or to test the idea of domestication? So there's this brilliant experiment that was set uh, up and, and conducted by uh, a group of uh, scientists in Siberia. Uh, and Dmitry Balaya was the leader of the group, uh, and he's an amazing story himself. But uh, he had a control line, an experimental line, and he kept them separate from one another, and he bred the control line randomly uh, for how they interact with people. The experimental line, though, he just did one simple thing, which is he would select foxes that essentially were attracted and enjoyed interacting with people and weren't fearful. They're just basically friendly foxes. He let them breed together. And over uh, you know many generations, uh, he 
saw all sorts of crazy things happen that he didn't select for. So, for instance, these friendly foxes relative to the control line have uh, floppy ears at a very high rate. They have curly tails at a high rate. Um, they got different multicolored coats. Uh, they had physiological changes that are related to um, drops in aggression and, and increase in friendliness. Um, and so the reason that was important for me was you have a, a population that essentially had been experimentally domesticated because they had all the signs that we can we think of in relation to uh, when you think of domesticated animals. They even had the star mutation, the white spot on their forehead um, that you think when you think of horses and cows, etc. What, what mutation? It's called the star mutation. And it's a white spot on your forehead that you, when you think about, uh, you know, horses and cows, they have that uh, as well, or even pigs. Um, so that set up this great opportunity to test the idea that maybe uh, if domestication really is selection against aggression and selection for friendliness towards people, which of course makes sense. How could you have a domesticated animal if it was always trying to attack you? Um, and so, you know, or it was so scared of you. Uh, that it was too stressed to live in captivity. So, um, you know, simply selecting for friendliness, you get all these different changes that you associate with domestication. The foxes set up the possibility of asking, well, what about psychology? This remarkable ability to read human gestures, um, to use humans as social tools, is that also uh, a product of selecting for friendliness? And the answer is yes. The foxes uh, look like dogs. The domesticated foxes look like dogs. In reading human gestures, the control line do not. They look wolves uh, in trying to understand people. Uh, on your book, when you're talking about the domestication of foxes, you come up with another uh, quote uh, explaining science across, which I think is brilliant. You said that we cannot experiment, we cannot, we cannot experiment. We are leaping from science into the realm of storytelling. So, could, could you elaborate why we so need to experiment to classify things? experiment is so important. Yeah, well, I mean, the, the, the challenge was, I mean, we published a paper in Science, which is a, you know, very prestigious um, journal, and basically we were ruling out the first two hypotheses that, you know, dogs' remarkable skills to use human gestures um, evolved uh, in wolves, and it was just shared and inherited, and that uh, we also ruled out the hypothesis that a lot of experience gave um, dogs these skills, and we didn't find really evidence for those two hypotheses. So by default, we favored the third hypothesis that it was something about domestication. But we didn't have any evidence for that. We only had evidence against the other two hypotheses, and that left that third hypothesis standing. And really, that's where we would have been stuck if Dmitry Belayev had not done his experimental domestication, where we knew the selection pressure, and we knew uh, that the foxes are domesticated. And that set up the possibility to actually test, is it true that domestication does this? And we went and did an experiment with those foxes, and wow, lo and behold, even though they were not selected to be smarter, to be better at using human gestures, they were as a result of being selected to be friendly and domesticated. So we had evidence, now direct evidence, that it really was domestication that did this, uh, and that's why we needed an experiment, because otherwise it was just a story. It was a great story that it was domestication. Everybody loved it, because we love to think about, you know, the fact that we domesticated dogs and made them smarter. And I mean, it's true. Yeah. I think that's important. I mean, we have to separate what we can prove and what we cannot prove. That's right. Yeah. <coughs> people, when I talk about this kind of research, people like to think that um, we selected the wolves. Oh yeah, uh, and, sure. And, and that's not the correct explanation. So, what likely to have happened? Yeah, I think people like the idea that we created dogs in our own image, and uh, you know, it kind of reverberates back with many people uh, to probably their you know religious upbringings or whatever. But the uh, I don't think that's what happened at all. I don't think I think the best evidence, and especially because of the Belaya foxes, um, all you need to do is select. Uh, Animals are at an advantage if they're friendly to people. They're going to have more babies and they're going to reproduce more. If that happens, then you can have the whole domestication process seen in Belize experiments occur, including more cognitive sophistication. 
being able to solve social problems you couldn't before. So think about, you know, I was just at a, a, a restaurant and eating outside, and there were all these sparrows dancing around, running under our tables, stealing food. They were within a few inches of my feet. Now, those, those sparrows are making a killing. They're eating tons of food. They're fat and healthy. And that's because they're not afraid of people. I am sure that if we were to go take that same species of sparrow that's living out in the country with no people, they would not be able to fly underneath the table like that uh, if we brought them to the city. They'd be too scared. So um, I think the same thing happened with dogs. Is At some point in human evolution, humans started creating a new food resource that if you could be friendly and not fearful towards human populations, you were a big-time winner evolutionarily. And a population of wolves chose us. We didn't choose them. Why in the world? would hunter-gatherers who are competing with wolves, you know, they're annoyed with wolves. Every day I go out and I'm trying to kill an elk or a bison or a deer and the stupid wolves already got there and scared them off or eating the best food. Why in the world would you want to bring one home and leave it at home with your kids? That doesn't make any sense. Um, so it's it's got to have been that the wolves, uh, just like the birds under my table, realized there was this wonderful resource, uh, scraps, around the human camp and you know they snuck in snuck out and of course after a few generations they would have shown morphological changes like we see in the foxes and then people could see the difference between oh those are the annoying wolves that come in and steal you know scraps or whatever those aren't the same ones we're out there competing with i don't care about those um so they would have been at a major selective advantage against aggression is a select for friendless that make the morphological, the morphological changes. Uh, right. We didn't select those morphological traits separately. We did only one selection. It was against aggression. Yeah, so basically the way to think about it is that selecting for friendliness towards people and against aggression, it creates uh, a whole bunch of changes beyond that in morphology and psychology and once those differences are there, now selection can act on that. So then you can directly select on it. But it wasn't created. It wasn't like, oh, people are like, oh, I really think dogs with floppy ears would be super cute. Let's, let's make dogs with, and we'll breed floppy ear dogs together. That's not how it happened. There was selection against aggression. There were, some, there were some individuals with floppy ears because of the selection against aggression and for friendliness. And then people said, oh, well, that would be really cute to put the floppy ear guys together. So we didn't create the floppy ears. We then took advantage of the variance that selecting against aggression created. Um, so again, just to say, the key thing is, I think most people, because you can't see evolution happening, I mean, evolution isn't any different than gravity. When I drop this ball, I can't stop it from dropping. There's nothing I can do about it. It's an unstoppable force. Well, evolution is not any different. It's unstoppable. Just because you can't see it doesn't mean it's not acting all the time. Anybody who's taken antibiotics has done a major evolutionary experiment in their gut because you've killed microbial communities and they are fighting each other and you, you basically dropped a bomb on them and you know who comes back and who survives and who's selecting uh, and winning. I mean, that's evolution. I mean, you're, you, you didn't see it, but you, you made it happen. And, and so, uh, you know, evolution's happen all the time. Uh, I have a white deer that comes and eats in my front yard. And um, in normally, deer near humans is a bad idea. Uh, you know, if you're 100 miles from my house, or maybe even 25 miles from my house, and you walk up and eat out of somebody's front yard, you are going to be venison. You're going to be dinner. But where I live in the suburbs, everybody thinks it's cute and adorable. There are deer in my front yard. Well, it ends up that there's a very high proportion in where I live of deer that have... Um, different color coats that are white, uh, you know, have albino. And the prediction would be that if we compared the morphology of deer living near me and deer out in the country where they're hunters, that you would see um, many, many more um, piebald or white deer in suburban communities. There is research already that shows that deer 
that live in sub, in the suburban areas um, that are um, invading urban areas that they're larger, they're more social, and they're having more offspring than deer that live farther away from humans. So the idea that you know we're in control is just silly. You know, there's no way evolution happens. We don't control it um, unless we're doing artificial selection. And just because you're not doing artificial selection, that doesn't mean that evolution didn't happen. And uh, what do we find when we compare bonobos and chimpanzees? I mean, the bonobos, this kind of uh, friendly dog that we see in dogs, you can see as well in bonobos. So what are the major differences between bonobos and chimpanzees regarding their behavior? Yeah, so uh, the idea is bonobos really served as a test case for the thinking that natural selection, not artificial selection, but natural selection can actually cause domestication. So we call it self-domestication. The species can actually, through natural selection, interfacing with its environment, um, end up as much like a domesticated animal. And when we compare uh, chimpanzees and bonobos uh, to wolves and dogs, we see many of the same changes between wolves and dogs have occurred between bonobos and chimpanzees. So basically, chimpanzees are like the wolf of the ape family, and bonobos are like the dog of the ape, ape family. Um, so whether it's the morphological differences or um, uh, the behavioral or cognitive differences, bonobos really are the dog of the uh, of our ape family. So Philippe, just to let you know, I've got about three minutes left so I'm sorry about that I gotta go do um, I'm making a podcast and I gotta go do an interview I mean I do read some scripts or something okay I'm, I'm gonna finish with, with one question that um, I about to ask everyone because uh, what we do what, what we tend to do in the skeptic community is, is try to, to we talk about the dog research and I don't think it's gonna be very difficult to people believe that we are insane but I mean, when we talk about evolution, a lot of people don't believe it. A lot of people have, sure. have uh, rejected uh, evolution. Sure. So, uh, one of the question is, how, you come to the public, you engage to the public, so what do you think is the best approach to come to people that uh, do not believe in evidence, that do, do, don't think in evidence-based way, and come to drag them? And those people usually think, I mean, we call faith-based thinking. So, what do you think is the best approach to bring them together? So you're calling me from Brazil, right? I'm calling you from Brazil, yeah. Um, Rio de Janeiro, where Olympic Games is going to take place in about three months from now. Very exciting. So, um, by the way. <laughs> okay, all right. Um, so what, uh, you know, we had it in Atlanta. Um, so it, it, you'll survive. Um, the, uh, so when's the last time the Pope was in Brazil? Mm, I think about two years, one year. I don't know. Has, the, has Pope Francis been there? So, so that's my answer, is uh, Brazil is a very, uh, you know, has a rich uh, religious community. Yeah, Catholicism, Catholicism is very powerful there. And I think one of the things, at least in the United States, I don't know about in Brazil, but in the U.S., I think people think that Christians uh, have a, some kind of hang-up with evolution, at least in the U.S. But actually, it's, a, it's totally not true. Uh, you know, the Catholic Church has no problem with evolution. Uh, they see evolution as being completely consistent with uh, Catholic doctrine. Uh, and really, it's a very small group of evangelical Christian groups that are unnerved by evolution. So I think that's the first thing, is that there are many people who are very uh, religious and don't reject uh, science, including the Pope. Uh, so I think that's that's the first. I, I, I would disagree a bit on that, but you can... okay, we we can we can. Uh, uh, I'd love to hear hear your thoughts. The um, but the uh, you know I think that that's the first thing is people are fearful because people love to play the in group out group card. Is you know science is something that other people do. Uh, I'm religious, and if you're religious and to be faithful. I can't believe in science because science is anti-religion. So that's a typical in-group, out-group response. I could go all into the neurobiology of it, uh, and people use, you know, 
terms of dehumanization and and try to use disgust and um, all sorts of um, typical strategies to have scientists become the outgroup or evolutionary thinkers be the outgroup. So the first thing you have to do as somebody who studies evolution is acknowledge that humans evolved to see in-group, out-group everywhere. And if you want to communicate with people and get them excited about you know, science, then you've got to talk to their in-group psychology. You've got to um, not have their xenophobic tendencies override any ability to use their rational brain. Because if you step into the door and the first thing you say is, you know, oh, you're religious, you're not like me, forget it. It's over. Um, so, you know, that's why I think it's important to realize that, you know, when, when theologians, religious thinkers have sat down and, you know, for instance, the Catholic Church, and they have synods and they have all sorts of conferences and they invite academics together, when they see the facts, they say, sure, okay, yeah, we're, we're cool. You know, we might not, we could quibble about details and, and, and also about how that's translated into actual policy or doctrine or how, it's, how people behave. But fundamentally, when they see the facts and you're not in a place where people are doing in group, out group psychology, there's no problem. have called theistic evolution, but theistic evolution is not the evolution that scientists understand that what what really is. So I don't I don't think that m when you uh, look at critically that Catholic Church really supports evolution. They say they support it. I think it's best. I think it's better than uh, rejected beforehand. Uh, there's a more room for us to, to come up with. But uh, if they say that God made a part of it, I mean, well, w mutation doesn't make more favor because it's good or bad. So so here's my hypothesis for you. So, so I don't disagree with anything you just said, but here's my hypothesis. I think if the science communicator, I'm just going to say the Catholic Church has no problem with my research. And I think we're going to win way more by doing that than worrying about what they... It, it's a good explanation. It's, it's a good explanation. It is instead of worrying about what they actually say, because they don't worry about what we say, so I'm not going to worry about what they say. I just want to turn off the in-group, out-group response. It's, it's a good approach. It's, it's, it's an interesting approach. And, and just to let you know, the genius of dogs was designed as a Trojan dog. The, a, the, a Trojan dog. Like the Trojan horse. Mm -hmm. The entire intent of that book was to get people who would never read about evolution or cognitive science excited to read about it. Because they care about dogs. So... Darwin started The Origin of Species with a chapter on domestication, and he did it on purpose because he knew that that was something people were familiar with and they wouldn't be threatened by. Uh, and so I think we have to do the same thing. I would like to thank you very much for, for your time, for your uh, fantastic explanation of this kind of research. And I will make the transcript. Uh, what I, I usually have done in the past is that uh, I've recorded the video. Uh, okay, cool. The, the, the transcript more easily. Uh, what I've done the past is to publish the, the video right away, but I changed my, 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 my methods. I okay. Will, I will hold the video. I, I, can, I will put it on YouTube and I can send it to you for you can see. Uh, but I will make it public. And I will make the transcript and when I'm finished, I try to publish in some magazine for popularization science. And I send awesome. everything out to you. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Hey, it's great fun. Um, thanks for being persistent. Oh, yeah. Thank you very much. All right, man. Take care. Thank